Great. So, so, so this is a, 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 a paper that's part of a, a, a cluster of, paper, of presentations that I've been doing in the last few months to try and understand my own teaching practice. I mean, I've, over the last few years I've developed a whole lot of sort of innovative courses and things um, and I don't really understand them. I don't know why they work. I don't know um, what, what the effect really is. And so this is a kind of a, 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 a after-the-fact reflection moment where I try and think about things that have happened in these courses and things that have gone wrong. Um, so, and this one is called market value and social value in tertiary teaching because it comes out of a, a set of problems. I've had two very bad experiences. Um, the one was doing my PhD in the United States and the other was working as a lecturer at UKZN. And these were bad experiences in a very, very specific way um, because what they introduced me to was a kind of a, a, a horror of the fact that my notion of the university is now a historical anachronism. The idea of the university as a place that you go to discover yourself and, and for people to develop progressive social values and contribute to social transformation, this, this is simply a, 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 an idea that is, that is on its, in its moment of historical decline because it's under attack from another set of ideas that seem at the moment to be much more powerful. And as part of my sort of, l sort of last stand against this change, which I think is a very, very, very bad change, um, I'm trying to identify some of the, the, the tensions and talk about how they play out in the context of a very specific course that I teach. Um, and this course, it's a, it's a course I offer at third year level um, within the psychology major um, called Understanding Violence. But let's just contextualize this market value versus social value um, tension that I'm setting up. What I'm saying is that um, that there's, there's been a shift, um, probably really that started in the UK and the United States in the 1980s, away from universities as public education resources for the benefit of society and towards them becoming competing managed corporate brands. And this is part of a, a, a sort of a global social and economic shift away from the sort of 20th century welfare state that, that really got uh, rose up after the Second World War and towards this kind of neoliberal sort of corporate uh, business controlled state that started escalating in the 1980s. Um, and it entails within universities of what I consider to be an extremely sinister shift from participatory governance by academics to corporate um, management by business managers. So the people actually running universities are no longer senior academics who sort of become members of Senate and then become senior administrators. It's these, these sort of MBAs that are, that, are, that are brought in to run universities as if they were corporations. And different universities manage this in a different ways. And sort of UKZN is one of the sort of worst case scenarios where where, 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 where the, the management is almost completely done on corporate lines and the university now can't, uh, openly and publicly um, um, pre presents its identity as a corporate brand. That is the language that they use to describe themselves, you, the, the corporate brand of the University of Brazilian Natal. Um, alongside this kind of, this, this big um, structural shift, there are very specific things that impact on academia. And they're, they're, around um, notions of um, cost cutting and quantifiable measures of productivity, which is of course how you should run a corporation. If you're producing widgets, you've got to cut your production costs and you've got to increase your productivity. But when you start applying language and concepts like that to universities, something very weird starts happening that, um, that, that really undermines the, the very notion of them as universities. Um, the other thing is the, the rise of, of, of branding and marketing and the, the obsession with ranking amongst universities. The way in which universities are, are trying to plug into this kind of international rankings. Um, and so they start conceptualizing themselves differently and, and managing themselves differently. Because if competitive branding and marketing and ranking become your objectives, those are totally different objection, objectives to, to kind of teaching and, and social objectives. And a couple of little things follow on here, that research suddenly becomes much more important than teaching, that graduation numbers become more important than quality of learning, and that job training becomes a goal rather than um, any sort of broader social and ethical outcomes. 
So that, that's, that, that's what I'm talking about when I talk about market values, as opposed to social values, which have to do with um, the idea that, that universities are public institutions. These are sort of taxpayer-funded, government-run institutions that exist for the benefit of the broader society, not for particular individual or political or corporate interests. And, and that part of that public interest, uh, and I think it's particularly relevant to people in the humanities, and social sciences is, 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 is the way in which universities are part of the development of democracy and human rights and the way in which they advance things like um, ideas of equality, mutual respect, safety, freedom, individual and collective well-being. And, and I think those, those kinds of well-being have multiple dimensions. Um, and in as much as those are part of the, the kind of social value of the university, um, that, that one of the core interests in the university then is, is critical and transformative pedagogies, um, um, sort of forms of teaching that, that are not about imparting knowledge or job training, but about creating certain kinds of people, creating certain citizens who participate in the social world in a particular way that makes that social world better. So we, we're really looking at this process of how do you change people to make them kind of better people that produce a better world. And these are questions that make no sense uh, to the corporate university. Um, that they're fundamental to the idea of, the, of the, 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 uni the public university as a social resource. Um, so you get this tension between these two value systems. Um, but what I really want to talk about is how this tension plays out in this very particular course. So um, I was, I've always been very interested in the problem of violence in South Africa. And one of the things that interests me is that there's almost no teaching that I know of on the subject of, of violence. There, there are very few university courses that are specifically designed to look at the problem of violence and how to solve it. Certainly there's not very much in my discipline, which is um, psychology. Um, and, it's certain, and it's not considered a kind of traditional core area in psychology, nor is having expertise in violence reduction considered a, a, a core professional area in which you could become employed. Um, so this created the immediate problem is there's, that there's no sort of curriculum and materials and not much expertise in that, in that area. So part of the work of introducing this course was to develop that, and, and that's been a lot of my work for the last 10 years now is actually writing this new curriculum, developing theoretical frameworks for talking about violence in South Africa and creating um, a kind of a, a body of students who graduate with expertise in this area. Um, a, 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 an immediate problem also in the context of introducing this is that, that institutions are intrinsically conservative. Um, so the idea of innovating, of introducing a new area that just hasn't existed before that, that, that already requires kind of massive kind of justification. And the specific problem within the kind of corporatized university is the, um, the, the resistance to allocating resources for new things, especially new things that aren't going to fit the kind of marketing and ranking goals of the, of the university. So how does one justify that in terms of this course? Um, in terms of the course um, content and, and, and goals, um, there's a number of things I was interested in looking at, at there. How do we understand violence? And, 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 and that's a much deeper question than it seems to be, because what I was interested in is the different accounts of these kind of popular accounts of violence as well as the academic accounts of violence, you know. Um, like why, why, you know, why, why, why do people commit acts of violence? Why do, we, why do men rape? So you have these kind of popular accounts um, that say, oh, well, we should castrate all rapists and that'll function as a deterrent and then the problem of sexual violence will go away. And these accounts are, on close examination, kind of nonsensical and, and um, they, they're not backed up with the existing research and analysis. And then you've got these kind of scientific theories that also compete with each other. Some of them are like social learning theories or evolutionary psychology theories or stuff about um, social norms. And they don't agree with each other. So, so I'm really interested in the sort of mess of conflicting ideas and getting students to, to think critically about what it means to adopt an explanatory framework at all for anything, let alone for the topic of violence. Um, and so to, to produce that understanding and then really look at the problem of how we could reduce violence in South Africa. And, and interestingly, as I started testing this out, three really important things started becoming significant. The one was shifting uh, the, 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 the sort of popular idea that violence is linked to criminality 
and say that in fact that's, that's false. And most violence in South Africa is not linked to things like property crimes. It is, it is everyday interpersonal violence. And that, that completely changes the way we conceptualize the problem. That also leads to a shift away from kind of law enforcement and bringing back the death penalty and shoot to kill legislation through to thinking much more about social norms and, and behaviors and how those get sort of created and, and, and perpetuated. Um, but the most significant thing of, of all that happens as a result of this kind of conceptual shift is a shift to understanding the way in which we all participate in violence in everyday life as both perpetrators and victims. Um, and, and that's actually a, quite a, a thing that needs a lot of explanation that I can't give in this paper. Um, but you might get some sense of what I mean by it later on. But what this has meant when I started doing the courses is that suddenly, and to, me, to my great surprise, and, 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 and um, it created a real kind of problem, is I didn't know what I was doing and I didn't know how to, to respond to what was going on, is the course shifted from what I thought it was going to be was about me teaching kind of social and psychological theory to a course that was about um, personal and social transformation of the students. Um, um, so that raised a whole lot of, of, of some methodological problems in teaching the course. Um, it already took place in the, in, in, within the background of the fact that this course didn't really fit well in the discipline in that it wasn't a course that was recognized as core curriculum nor was it clear to the people governing the discipline that it led to a professional career outcome. So, so, so that was a kind of a difficult thing to justify. Um, but what was much more significant than that is that it became very clear that the course had subjective um, meaning to the students and that it actually triggered very, very specific kind of emotional responses in them. That most of the students in the course had had personal experience of being victims and perpetrators of violence. And um, the, the, I mean, the, the, the essential thing about the experience of violence is it tends to be a traumatic experience. I mean, it, it invokes massive negative emotions. Um, and this started happening to the students. They started suddenly um, being confronted with these kind of memories of child abuse, bullying, sexual abuse, assaults, family violence, all kinds of things like that. And that, and, and that these emotions were suddenly erupting as part of their response to the readings and the lectures and the class discussions. Um, so this became a kind of thing that had to be managed and, and it was clear what we needed to do then is that we had to, um, we, we, we really had to provide very, very intensive, close monitoring of the individual students and, and their emotional needs and how, to, and how to meet those needs and how to take them through the course in a kind of a way that the intellectual and emotional needs kind of were, were met in an integrated way and that they weren't just left feeling emotionally traumatized and, and abandoned in a, in, a, in a sort of dysfunctional way that they, they couldn't cope with. Um, but to do that, we needed to have things like small classes, highly trained tutors running discussion groups, and effective student support services in, in, in cases where student, students actually needed professional counseling. Now, the trouble with that is um, that those are not the kind of things the corporate university is interested in putting on the table. That, that just absolutely um, goes in the opposite direction to their sort of cost-cutting and productivity models. Um, so, so what were we to do in that situation? Um, and there, there are a couple of sort of um, uh, um, solutions, kind of ad hoc patchwork solutions that I started experimenting with. And one of them was simply allocating much more time to class discussion, bearing in mind these are contact courses. Um, and actually instead of doing a lot of traditional lecture delivery, actually using half of all the lecture time as, as large group discussions, um, and in fact doing something that's very similar to trauma debriefing, actually using the, the group as a, as a kind of a psychological group to, 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 to provide emotional containment. And there are, there are a lot of specific ways that psychologists are, are good at doing that, which, 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 which I then started trying to implement as part of the teaching of the course. The other thing um, that I, I, I did is, is, and this is something which one, that, that's a sort of tactic in, in this field that we do with, with, with survivors of violence, is develop peer support networks. It's a very, very important strategy for providing support. Um, so setting up student groups, like uh, student groups working on supporting students who experience sexual assaults, things like that. 
Um, and also implementing virtual community support, like uh, online communities, discussion groups, linking up with victim support groups online. So creating a kind of a context and a, and a supportive social network. Um, at the same time, doing a certain kind of really important intellectual work in the course, um, because one of the big problems with certain kinds of violent victimization is that it's linked to victim blaming. The most common thing is like sort of blaming rape victims. Why were you there? What were you wearing? What were you drinking? That kind of stuff. And to really kind of intellectually challenge that sort of victim blaming, um, to do important psychological work of normalizing people's emotional reactions, saying yes, that anyone who has that experience would feel extremely distressed, like they were falling apart, cry, have nightmares, that's okay. Um, that those are kind of safe and manageable things and that, and, and that, 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 that you should expect to have and, and how to then um, uh, access support for that. Um, and also to help people identify their own coping mechanisms because everyone has ways of coping with kind of extreme distress um, often, but often they don't realize that and if they can consciously identify it they can enhance it. So these are kind of things that suddenly got mixed into what it started out as being a kind of critical social theory course about violence. Um, and then it became clear that the, the real core part of what this course was really doing, which, which is not what I had planned, but, but I now see as the fundamental significance of the course, is the course is about producing some kind of ideological change, is challenging the normalization of certain kinds of violence, like for instance the normalization of violence against children as a way of regulating their behavior. This is an overwhelming norm that's supported by over 95% of South Africans saying, well, what, what happens when you normalize that, that kind of violence, or, or normalized violence in sexual negotiation, or um, situations like that. Um, to get people to think about the way in which a lot of their, their, their justifications of violence was a response to threats. Okay, we need to be violent because there's a threat of crime, or, or I need to be violent because this person is threatening my social status, and they're insulting me, something, things like that. And also the way violence is linked to to kind of concepts of, of race, class, and gender, that there's certain groups of people that are, are violent threats, that, that poor people are dangerous, um, things like that, that um, really, really challenging those kinds of things. Um, so, we're then not really being able to tell you very much interesting about that course in, in those three minutes. Um, just some things that I've learned from that that I'm, that, that I'm hoping we can think about more deeply is firstly the, the insight, I mean the conclusion, that, that addressing violence in South Africa in an academic course is, is something that really has great social value. I mean, that, 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 that dealing with this social problem is, is both a practical, doable thing and something that could make the society better. Um, and that it can be done in specific ways, challenging norms, prejudices, false beliefs, teaching nonviolent interventions, and creating sort of tangible support networks for survivors of violence. Um, the interesting lesson for me was that this doesn't just involve teaching social and psychological theory, which I thought it did when I developed the course, and that it involves a much more complex set of, of, of interventions that are simultaneously interventions at the level of ideology, at the level of identity, at, at the level of meeting people's psychological needs, of creating supportive social networks. Um, the important thing to go back to my title here, which is a particular angle that I want to, to come out of this, is how badly this started fitting with the, the corporate model of the university, with the idea of cost cutting and efficiency and throughput rates. And also the corporate university has a great interest in staying away from controversial things. They don't like bad publicity and lawsuits and things going wrong. They have a great interest in being deeply conservative socially. Um, and, and the difficulties um, being put in a situation where the students were evaluating this course consistently in every evaluation as the most important course they've ever done, a course that changed their lives. Um, this, they would say things like, this is the reason I came to university, this is the only course that's ever taught me anything worthwhile. And at the, at, at the other sort of side of the, the argument, having the, the university managers saying, look, that, 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 this thing is unjustifiable, we can't put resources into it, it's risky, it's not part of what we understand as our, our core responsibility of job, job training. Um, 
And then, and, and, and thinking about that and, 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 and trying to sort of formalize in my own head both how one can work under those institutional conditions, a kind of limiting ad adverse institutional conditions and still do some kind of transformative pedagogy, but at the same time recognizing that simply acquiescing and saying, well, we must learn to work under, under conditions of restraint. So that, that's actually not what we should do. What we should do is we should, we should challenge this model of the university. That, that one of the core lessons out of this is that if we really care about students and the future of the society, we need to start um, pushing back against this sort of corporatization and managerialism within the university because it has a fundamentally negative effect on the ability to produce um, citizens and a society that actually serves a public interest. Thank you very much, Anthony. We'll take a few questions. Uh, Anthony has left a bit of time for questions, so we could take two questions. Yep. Yeah, I think it's quite evident that uh, this, this, this kind of force is essential to you know, the society, never mind the students who go to the courses. Um, so just a simple question, who are your allies? <laughs> Well, I, I've got a lot of allies, <laughs> all my students, um, that's it. I mean, that the, that, that the people fighting for this are the, are the students who've just been amazingly supportive and yeah. radical and outspoken. The trouble is within the institution that I've been at, which is UKZN, there's, there's almost no allies left at a kind of management level. They've either been sort of forced out or just, you know, sold out in some kind of way. Um, and, and so, well, my, my personal choice is actually to leave that institution now because I don't think it's, it's viable. There are other institutions which there are where, where this kind of social value is still very, very highly valued. I think many of the kind of liberal universities in South Africa still see why this kind of thing can be good. And I think that we, most of us operate in the kind of space of tension between universities where that, that have got that kind of historical progressive notion of the university, plus they've got the sort of managerial pressure of get up the rankings, research productivity, cost cutting, efficiency, um, all of those kinds of things. And most of us live in, 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 in that space of tension between these two kind of institutional and ideological forces. And what, in, what interests me is, well, how do we, how, how do we work in that? And, 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 and specifically to make the point, not how do we work in it to cope with less and less resources and more and more pressure to be different. How do we also resist that? How do we come up with a way of, of talking about the value of what we're doing that makes it as concrete and tangible as the value of their cost-cutting and productivity goals? Thank you. 